can squeeze it. Pull and squeeze it. Would you like to see? Mm. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's. That's incredibly loud for a very small room. Have we saved up for the volume control yet? No, it turns out not. That's what charities are problems. Anyway, we should have bought less marble and more volume controls. Anyway, right. Uh, my name's Thorsten Bell. I'm the director of the Resolution Foundation. To where you are, very uh, welcome uh, today. Um, so economics is not going very well. Is the starting point of uh, tonight. Uh, today is the 10-year anniversary of. Uh, the UK's bank bailout. The, um, uh, it was a traumatic experience for lots of us. The um, uh, pay today is less than it was before the financial crisis, 10 years on, and not just in the UK. In lots of the developed world, productivity growth is a disaster. Uh, then to make sure everyone's really depressed, we've got a politics that involves uh, Trump. Uh, we've got tied party politics in the UK, uh, despite being in Brexit Britain, and broader sense of divides and populism across lots of the developed world. So it's all going very well. Then, uh, if there are ideas out there to try and fix some of that, that would be a very good thing indeed. <laughs> and where do ideas come from? Not from people's brains or thinking. They come from books. <laughs> so we're going to celebrate two of them tonight. We have two books. They're bloody heavy. Linda's is marginally heavier. I leave you to judge what that so tells I'm you. I'm going to help myself towards the thing. Oh, is it not? Okay. <laughs> but inc still incredibly light. Look, still very light. <laughs> like, the, um, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, the first book we're going to talk about is from Paul Collier, who is a professor of economics and public policy at Oxford and has written a lot of books on some huge questions over the years. Uh, but today's small question is the future of capitalism facing new anxieties, the, um, uh, which is a very small question to deal with. Um, and he's covering the rifts and divides of modern developed countries, but the UK into a large part, uh, the relationship between a weak capitalism and populists that provide what aren't known as solutions. And then and lots of it's quite depressing, I'm going to be honest. Uh, but it does have answers, which is the key and why it gets to count as ideas. So we're going to hear from Paul about this one. And it's 20 quid upstairs if he hasn't given you all the answers by the end and you should buy it. He's also got something scarily called the hard centre, which is a, I'm sure you're going to talk about quite a lot, which is scary if nothing else. There we then we're going to hear from Linda. Uh, Linda also has an economics post at the University of Oxford, but just to make sure this isn't a total Oxford loving, uh, she also has lots of other things, London Business School, Broadcast, you all know who she is. Uh, and she's not content with one person's set of ideas, so we get 12, I think. 12, is that right? 12 people's versions of ideas in The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. Now, the good thing about this is it, is it doesn't just have the lives of 12 economists and some of their ideas, but, but bravely gives us Linda's take on how they would try and address today's question. So it's kind of a cheat sheet to 12 economists. For the so Paul's going to give us one really detailed one, and then Linda could just tell us 12, just <laughs> off we go. So that is the plan. Um, they're each going to have about 15 minutes, and then we'll open up for a bit of a discussion and then questions. And by then, by 7 p.m., we will have solved the future of capitalism, and everyone can go into the night. So, Paul, thank, thank you. Thank you. So um, we need capitalism to work. Um, but it doesn't work on autopilot. Um, every now and then it derails and that produces catastrophe. There have been three big derailments over the last 200 years, which is kind of the, the period of capitalism. And the, the first was in the 1840s. Um, you got the, the magic of capitalism that Adam Smith noticed, the surge in productivity, you bring people together, scale and specialization, wow, much more productive. So peasants flooded into the cities, they became more productive, and they died like flies. Because those industrial cities, in my part of the world, north of England, that was the first on earth, became killing fields. Um, life expectancy, 33 if you were a rural laborer, 19 if you went to town, right? Killing fields. So that was the first big derailment. Uh, and then the second was obviously the 1930s, which is a bit more in our range of memories. Very different derailment, mass unemployment, very different set of solutions. But in each case, those derailments were corrected. Public policy rose to deal with 
the anxieties that people were facing and, and, and produced uh, viable solutions. What's gone wrong this time is, is something new. Right? It's another derailment. And it's not just 2008. Right? The derailment goes back, I think, to about the 1980s. And it's three new, very serious divergences, social divergences. One is spatial, and it's between a booming metropolis like London and broken towns and cities in the provinces. And it's not peculiar to Britain. It's happening all over. And there are good reasons for it. There's economic explanations which I'll try to briefly mention. The second new social divergence is the new class divide, which is no longer about wealth. It's about education. It's the tertiary educated, it's the college educated who are on an up escalator. Their skills are becoming more and more valuable. And then the less than college educated who've got non-cognitive skills, manual skills, and they're on a down escalator. Their skills are becoming less and less valuable. Um, there's a third divergence I won't talk about, but that's between the, the, the countries which are really accelerating, doing great, catching up very fast, and the countries which are actually continuing to diverge and falling apart, the part of the world that I work on. Bizarrely, um, I straddle all three of these divides in my own life. Um, uh, the, uh, I now live in prime Metroland. My postcode is the highest ratio of house prices to income in the whole country. Um, but I grew up in Sheffield. And you all know what happened to Sheffield, even if you don't know that you know. Because most of you will have seen the film The Full Monty. And that's Sheffield. Uh, and it's tragic comic. Like everything in Yorkshire, it has a tinge of humour to it, but it's actually a tragedy. That was a 700-year-old skill cluster built around steel. Uh, Sheffield was went in Chaucer, as that's where they make knives. Um, and it got broken in about five years in the early 80s. And that was my relatives living the lives of the full Monty, losing their jobs, desperate. Um, and then the education divide. Um, I've got you know, about as much education coming out of I, my ears as is reasonable to have. Um, Oxford, Harvard, Paris, all sorts of things, you know, quite fancy. Um, but my family are not like that. Both my parents left school when they were 12. Um, and part of the book is about a divergence in lives. I was born on the same day as my cousin, and our lives have totally diverged. And so the book is tinged with passion. You know, it's an economics policy book, but it's quite a passionate and angry book because I've lived these divides personally. And I wrote the book because I think they're tragedies that could have been avoided and must be healed. Um, why um, were those divergences not addressed? There are solutions. Why were they not uh, generated? And I think there's an explanation. After all, we've had governments of the right, we've had governments on the left, and neither have actually healed these divides. And the reason is that both the left and the right got captured by um, new intellectual ideas, which diverted them from their original purpose. So on the right, um, original, the, the, the first derailment of capitalism in, 19, in the 1840s um, produced the first move towards one nation um, conservatism, as it were, the, the small c. One nation business, if you like. So Sir Titus Salt, who was a big industrialist, one of the pioneer industrialists, made a fortune, gave it all away. No? became mayor of Bradford in the year 1849 when the cholera struck. There's no solution to cholera at the time. So imagine you're, you're a philanthropic mayor of Bradford and thousands of people are dying. And so his response was to use his fortune partly to build Saltair, the first town 
that was decent for his workers to live in. And that then got copied by Cadbury, by Leverhulme, and that tradition is still alive with John Lewis. Right? So that was the original culture of the, of, as it were, of the business, of business community. And then relatively recently, within the last 40 years, that got derailed by a new intellectual tradition, Friedman. Friedman, the sole purpose of business is to make a profit. Right? Sir Titus Salt didn't think so. Right? The Lieber brothers didn't think so. Cadbury didn't think so. John Lewis didn't think so. But Friedman thought it. It went right through the business schools. Sorry, didn't it? Didn't it? I mean, it went right through the business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gave her. I gave her a very nice endorsement for a book. Um, the um, so it was partly Friedman, partly the libertarians, who just denigrated the state, as if we couldn't function without a state. We need an active state to correct for these periodic derailments. So that was on the right. It got diverted into a completely different agenda that denigrated the very things that are needed to correct these derailments. Meanwhile, on the left, you start in the same t place and the same time, the, the 1840s, the crisis decade that's hell on earth in the northern cities. So in the business community, you get Titus Salt. In the working mo movement, you get the birth of the cooperative movement, just next door in Rochdale. Uh, there they were. And what was Rochdale about? What was the cooperative movement? It was, first of all, practical solutions for the real anxieties that most people faced. Where do you get a house? Building societies. One thing that we've forgotten, top of the list, can, when I die, will I have a funeral? And so the cooperative movement became the biggest funeral director on earth, on, in the world, you know. Um, so that was the, the starting tradition. It was about building reciprocal obligations. The genius of reciprocal obligations is that all the obligations you generate, which are the nasty bits, are precisely match, matching the rights, which are the nice bits. Right? So that's where we started. And then it gets derailed. The economists come along. And the economists fall in love with utilitarian philosophy because economists like maximizing things and utilitarian philosophy says there's things called utils. Um, you just add them up and maximize them. And uh, economics has a very grotesque picture of what a human being is. They're totally greedy and totally lazy. Yeah? So we want consumption and we don't want to work. There are people like that, but they're not normal humans, right? They're slobs, right? Um, but that's the economic model. Yeah? I mean, frankly, it, it is, right? Um, and so we'd have this need to add up all the utils and maximize them, but you couldn't rely on ordinary people because they were greedy little shits. And so you needed some saints. And here Plato came to the rescue because Plato had got these saints, they were called Platonic Guardians, and he made one little technical mistake, old Plato. He thought that Platonic Guardians were philosophers, and the economists put him right about that, right? Um, and so what did we do? Well, it was a very simple matter of taxing the incomes here and then running Benefit Street here. So you took a bit of consumption from here and you gave it to there. So that was, that was exemplified by new labor. All right, you let London rip, you tax it, and that pays for Benefit Street. And um, so that was the economists on the left. And then on the, uh, the other profession that moved in with the lawyers, and they loved rules, uh, uh, group rights for victims. Um, of course, some victims are more equal than others. But that's so um, in both of these cases, what happens, both the economists and the lawyers, the obligations are stripped from people. They float up to the state. And then what showers down from the state is rights. So you've completely detached the process of generating obligations from the process of generating rights. And it all goes pear-shaped. Um, what's the consequence of that? Mutinies. Mutinies. Unaddressed anxieties, mutinies. Brexit, Trump. What are they? They're mutinies. Right? 
as with all mutinies, they don't have a solution. Huh? Mutiny on the bounty, the poor guys ended up on Pitcairn Island in the middle of nowhere. Right? Um, we've ended up with Brexit, they've ended up with Trump. Right? These are not solutions to the anxieties, but the anxieties and the anger are real enough. And they're there because they haven't been addressed. Um, what has taken them, what has filled the vacuum is the extremes. And we, we see the extremes of the right, the extremes of the left, and they talk the right talk. They're addressing the anxieties. Of course, they haven't got solutions, and they don't even intend, really, to address the anxieties. They've got their own very particular agendas. We know what the agendas of the far right and the far left are, and they're not really fixing people's problems, but they know that their route to power is talk the talk of the anxieties. Um, so what can be done? Well, unfortunately, I've only got four minutes left to tell you, so you'll need to buy the book, but, um, um, but, um, but um, I can tell you um, one person um, who did a review yesterday in the Sunday Times um, thinks that my solutions are worse than the disease. Right? In fact, he says, um, this, this is Lord Lawson, who was Thatcher's great chancellor of the Exchequer, and he, he says, if Collier's solutions are the solution, they're worse than Labour. Um, there isn't a future for capitalism if, if his solutions are the solution, right? So I, I was rather relieved by that. Um, um, and it, so I'm either crazy, if you, if you listen to Nigel, Lord Lawson, um, but if you listen to Nobel laureate in economics, uh, George Akerlof, he says, um, rather embarrassingly, I mean, I don't know him very well, but, it, but he said, um, this is the, the most revolutionary work in social science since Keynes, and it needs to be listened to and acted on, right? Um, so that's him. And then there's that other um, Marxist revolutionary, um, Lord Mervyn King, um, who says this is... He says this is really good economics linked to, to, to you know, sort of good ethics. Um, and then finally there's that noted um, fascist Michael Sandel, the moral philosopher at Harvard, who's also endorsed it. So you either listen to Lord Lawson or you listen to them. Um, you t so what are the ideas? I've got th three ideas I want to do, and I'll take a minute each, right? One is what's called social maternalism. That's a phrase so new that Google won't accept it, spell check, you know. What is social maternalism? It's kind of the antithesis of the social paternalism that we've had. Social paternalism, the state knows best, it takes the authority of families. Social maternalism pushes assistance down to families. Families have got to work. They've got to work because they're the only organizations we know that actually can succeed in bringing up children, which is the fundamental task. And so we've been disastrous uh, in actually providing practical support all along the way from the birth of the first child through that child's life in school, preschool, training, out of hours schooling. And there's some very good books now coming out on that. Um, uh, Robert Putnam, um, Our Kids, um, um, Lord Layard, Thrive, a book just came out this week. These are the practical social maternalism approaches. So that's social maternalism. You just help families to rear children at all the potential, anticipating all the many points of, of, of crisis. I feel that very strongly because I had to salvage two little toddlers from the, uh, the, the, the tragedies in, in my extended family. And so I, I'm doing that. Um, second big idea, vocational training. Uh, Britain, probably more than any other society on earth, has got this culture of esteem in which esteem is attached to getting a degree. And so half of our population now, we've massively expanded, over-expanded the, the, the proportion of the population going to degrees, 
And some of those degrees just don't lead anywhere. Right? Um, what's the alternative? It's, getting, it's taking vocational training really seriously. And the model here um, is that epitome of the Marxist state, um, Switzerland, um, where 60% of young people take the vocational route. Um, why do they do that? Because the vocational route is serious. It's also seriously prestigious. You know, some of the guys who are the chief executives of the big Swiss banks took the vocational route. You can get right to the top with the vocational route in Switzerland. But its defining feature, four years, four years, you're paid to do vocational training. Half of the money for vocational training comes from firms. So firms make damn sure that you come out productive. Right? So that's how to do it. There's a role model there already. Uh, what we do is pathetically inadequate. Right? That We put all our fuss and resources into the cognitive skilled, who are already the overprivileged, and we totally ignore the 50% plus of the population that should be taking the non-cognitive route. So social maternalism, vocational training, and finally, um, broken cities. Um, Sheffield was an avoidable tragedy. Um, we can't put the steel industry back in Sheffield, but we need to put a new knowledge cluster into Sheffield and places like Sheffield. A few months ago, I spoke at Stoke, and if you think Sheffield's a tragedy, Stoke is much more of a tragedy. It's just nobody made a film of it. Right? That was the pottery industry. Totally destroyed, nothing in its place. Right? Um, the forces of agglomeration privilege the very big. And once one of these knowledge clusters gets broken, the market forces don't bring another one back. It's possible to get another one back, but you need public policy to do it. Um, the very distinguished and smart metropolitan con commentator, Janan Ganesh, who you know, I think many of you will read, described the, the London perspective on provincial England. He said, it feels like being shackled to a corpse. Where's the ethics in that? Where's the, the, the shared identity, the shared sense of responsibility? Right? Shackled to a corpse. I'll tell you what it feels like from the provinces. It feels like we're shackled to a shark. Right? Because a lot of the activities in London that are very high income are actually zero sum activities the asset management, the law, and that sort of stuff, right? It's very highly paid, um, but it's not um, anything like as conducive to, to social well-being as it might be. So, social maternalism, vocational, vocational training, broken cities re rebuilt by active public policy, and the overarching one is restore an ethics of reciprocity in state, in firms, in families. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> it's definitely delivered on um, lots of depression plus some ideas, right. which, is a, which is a treat in life. <laughs> Linda, over to you. You've got 12 economists to cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a minute each. That's right. <laughs> thank you, Torsten. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to Rob and to Rebecca for helping arrange this evening. It's a real privilege to actually share stage with Paul. Um, I actually want to hear more. I want to see my minutes actually to him. Um, but um, um, let me uh, let me at least try to cover some of the issues um, in my book. There's there's certainly certain similarities in that we both look over history to see how we can take some of those ideas and lessons and help solve what we confront today. So as Torsten mentioned, I do it in a in a in a way that's centered around the people who have made history and where their ideas have changed the society in which we live. So I pick 12 great economists. I'm very, um, I should say, there's only one economist who's still 
uh, living in this book. He's in his 90s, and that's Robert Solow. So they're all economists of an earlier vintage. Um, so I take essentially the person, I write a biography so you understand their times, the context of their lives, and then what prompted them to come up with an idea that changes the way the welfare state is created or the way we think about inequality or trade. And then I take those ideas, I kind of filter through how that's changed over the last 250 years and see how those ideas can help us understand today's issues around inequality, around trade deficits, or worries over slow growth. Um, so that's the kind of approach uh, to the book. And when I was writing it, one of the things that struck me was actually a saying by Mark Twain, which is, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So at the moment, we're worried about a slow growth future, which is secular stagnation is the term that's now being used. Productivity is low. Are we gonna have the same improvements in living standards um, looking ahead as we've had in the past? Well, the first time this issue was raised, was in the 1930s when Alvin Hansen coined the term secular stagnation because he was worried um, with an aging population in the interwar period that we would end up with a slow growth future. Well, the 50s and 60s, the golden age of economic growth followed that. So those are just, just a kind of a picture of how it is that I ended up um, really looking at these issues through the prism of the wisdom of the economists that have come before. But I want to spend um, my few minutes um, talking about a very similar theme that Paul had covered um, with you, which is in the current system that we're living in, this breakdown in consensus around how society ought to be organized is one of our biggest challenges. And it's broader than economics, but there's a lot of economics within it, whether it's capitalism or globalization. So I want to make just a few points around what I um, cover in this book on this issue. So the very first thing to say is you will not be surprised to hear that this is not the first time the consensus around society and the economy has happened. You heard Paul mention a few episodes, and I'm going to pick a couple of episodes as well to illustrate what I mean. The first, um, one of the first breakdowns in consensus happened very early on during the 19th century. So Paul's covered the 1840s. Um, I'm gonna focus on the latter part of the 19th century, which is that was the very first Great Depression. It was known as the Long Depression. It's the Great Depression of the 19th century. That was the first time that unemployment appeared in the dictionary after the panic of 1873, which was a US crisis. Investment banks failed, led to a panic, and then contagion plus stagnation. It sounds a little familiar. Um, and that breakdown in terms of accepting the system that was there, the capitalist system crafted by the classical economists, such as David Ricardo building on the work of Adam Smith and others, really came under close examination and really rejection by a lot of people. So a couple of things happened in the latter part of the 19th century. One was the growth of the trade union movement, and you really saw that beginning to take off. And the ideology that came on the back of that was Marxism. So Karl Marx's ideas around communism and socialism gained a lot of traction when people became very disillusioned with the capitalist system that then existed. Um, and that breakdown in consensus moved us into the 20th century, which saw in the early part of the 20th century around 60% of the world lived in either cap um, communist or socialist systems. And there was a real battle in terms of which would be the economic system that would prevail. So that breakdown in consensus was so stark. You had the creation of the Soviet Union, and then laterally, you had the creation of communist China, which adopted a path which was um, against what Britain, America, Western Europe 
um, had, which was a capitalist system. And of course, as you know, in the interwar years, um, protectionism returned. There was, um, on the back of the Roaring Twenties, an even greater feeling that this system just didn't work for um, the average person. And it wasn't until the, the economists at the time who really began to argue the case, and that's the other thing that I pick up quite a lot in this book, which is today, economists are sort of viewed as technically trained people, um, utile, utility maximization, cost minimization, dual optimization, it's all very technical and really quite narrow. But the great economists um, were not narrow. They addressed the big questions. They, they were philosophers. Many of them had careers um, outside of academia. They were engaged with the big questions of the day, whether it was capitalism or communism, the philosophies around free markets, the philosophies around redistribution. So change only came about because there was this battle of ideas and the great economists crafted opposing arguments to win the hearts and minds of, um, of all of us. So after World War II, that was the creation of the NHS. You also saw the welfare state being created in other parts of the world as well. Welfare state <coughs> capitalism came after decades of really a battle between the capitalism of Adam Smith um, versus the socialism and the communist regimes that were um, beginning to spread. And welfare state capitalism essentially took hold. And that period was spanned some very, very tumultuous decades. But those ideas gave us society within which we currently live. But those ideas themselves are currently now under challenge. So we also saw by the end of the 1980s, the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so most of you will remember that as one of the defined, the reason I say most is sometimes when I um, talk to my students and I say, well, you remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, the world really changed. And I get some looks like, well, I was born in 1999, so I'm going to say, and I, <laughs> um, so, it, and it seemed at that time that by the time we got to the late 80s, 1990s, that this system was really winning the day, winning the argument. But of course, we know what happened since then. Um, more bubbles, financial crises, and then the systemic banking crisis that hit a decade ago. And we are now in another period in which there's a breakdown in consensus around the best economic system that we ought to, that would work um, to address some of the challenges that Paul's outlined. And in my book, I cover a range of issues um, that needs to have a new consensus built around a system that can work <coughs> to reduce inequality, um, to look at issues like um, why um, we might have issues around um, wages. So why are wages so low is one of my chapters. So I cover about 12 or 13 different topics and in each of those they're kind of um, uh, really potted summaries of the issues and by the end I try to give a sense about, I'll just give you one example about low wages, um, the kinds of options or discussions we ought to be having. So one of the issues around wages is why are wages so low? Why have we had stagnant wages in this country for a decade? Why have wages been stagnant in America for 40 years? I'm talking about real median wages. And one of the um, possible reasons is around monopsony. So that's monopoly power in labor markets. So is it because there's not enough competition um, for workers, which may be part of the solution? Um, is it because workers don't have enough bargaining power? Um, is it that firms have become too powerful? It would be different for different countries, but those are the kinds of um, questions and evidence that I, I look at to get people to think, is this one of the, uh, should we be looking at policy solutions around that? And on things like globalization, I focus on, we've had redistribution for um, a long time that hasn't quite worked 
um, for lots of reasons. Um, but one of them is, of course, when you talk about the losers from globalization, uh, most of the impact from uh, a lot of the stagnant wages, the shrinking of the middle class, isn't necessarily due to trade, but more to do with technology. So the solutions have to be crafted to think, yes, partly about globalization, but I would say also importantly around what technological change means. So that means instead of thinking about redistribution, you may want to think about pre-distribution, equipping workers better for a dis more disruptive age. Um, so those are some of the things that, um, that I uh, look at. I hope I've given you a flavor of it. And, um, but I'll just, um, I'll finish with one little anecdote about um, the great economists. Um, I haven't said too much about the individual ones that I've written, but since I mentioned wages, Joan Robinson is one of the great economists I write about. Latter day, she became um, much uh, more enamored of communism. And so in these kinds of debates, great economists also shift. Um, but she started off as a Keynesian. And she was one of the five, one of the very few women in economics at the time. She was one of Keynes's five members of, the, of his inner circle that was in, who were entrusted to review the general theory. She was um, also married to one other member of the inner circle. And she was having an affair with another one. So I'd like to think she had a controlling vote on um, the general <laughs> theory. I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> None of us saw that anecdote coming. Uh, it's complicated. I'm not even sure I understand it now. But anyway, there's, there's a few affairs as far as I can work out. There's the, um, uh, oh, she's not the only one. There's lots of affairs. As Paul what? People have affairs in life? <laughs> <laughs> anyone's got any other bombshells like that, they can drop later. Um, the, right, look, the, um, uh, you've touched on um, how in difficult times, consensuses break down and then yeah. new consensuses form. Yep. Um, and Paul, obviously, Paul's kind of, in lots of ways, the book is kind of a call to arms that that is what is needed. What, why do you, like, you know, you've got some ideas. There's, there's lots of people's worth of ideas in here. Why has, has, hasn't, any, why is there not any kind of inkling of a new consensus growing? Given that it sounds like everyone wants one, there's big problems, there's some ideas out there. Um, well, I think, um, I've tried already to sort of sketch an explanation for that, which is that both left and right have been captured by different agendas. The, um, uh, the, the weight of, um, of, of economics um, uh, is to, is, is, has been the idea that government's part of the problem, you need to deregulate, um, and, um, and then the most you need to do is tax here and do benefit street here. So it's a shriveled conception of what a human being is in which there's no conception of sort of dignity. People are stripped of being moral actors. They're just these little greedy consumers. So just to push a bit, so you're, you're, you're saying, so economics basically gave us the crash and then is kind of holding politics hostage. Is that kind of- Well, I mean, I think, Linda really said it's become very sort of narrowly technocratic and, and the people are very reluctant to take on the, the big issues. Um, um, and uh, and that, that's a very damaging thing because the, you know, the, the, these phenomena have become so gross that they've swept public policy aside. That's, you know, Brexit is a real phenomenon that's going to do a lot of damage. Similarly, Trump. Let's not start on Brexit. No, but on the, we won't. But 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 these are, these are the consequences of mutinies, which are very understandable, yep. um, and could have been avoided. Um, but economics wasn't talking about them. You know, I mean, this was, you know, famously, economics missed the whole damn crash. Um, the best measure. There's one funny little thing, which yep. is um, the IMF um, recruits exclusively one sort of person, which is people with doctorates in macroeconomics from good universities. Right? And so the IMF has perfectly encapsulated current thinking in economics. And uh, in uh, the annual report before the crash, what did the IMF annual report say? It said the world has got considerably safer thanks to the growth of derivatives markets. 
you couldn't make this stuff up, frankly. Um, you know, the thing that blew up the system was attributed just before the, the system blew up um, with, with making the system safer. So, uh, you know, this is... Um, and and um, I, I work a lot with Tony Venables, who's one of the sort of top three international economists on Earth. And Tony is very clear on this, that we owe a big mea culpa to people for exaggerating the benefits of, of globalization. And um, the, the, basically, ob economics is obsessed with efficiency, ignoring distribution, under the guise that um, if it's efficient, then the, whoever gains could compensate whoever loses and still be better off. And that word, could compensate, has been enough to say, isn't it all wonderful? Yeah. Um, and that, that's, you know, ethically really and intellectually really lazy because unless those redistributions are made, and some of them are massively unlikely, massively unlikely, great international redistributions, um, then there's no presumption that these forces of globalisation are going to be beneficial for ordinary people. On your, what, what, what country is kind of doing best at trying a new consensus. It goes without saying that we're like the worst. <laughs> but like, where's, where's doing a bit better? Um, I don't, I, I personally think there are, it's a, it's a breakdown to varying degrees across countries. Um, the reason I say that is because one of the other kind of big themes that I, um, I sort of, I, I touch on is that I think if you look at um, one of the, uh, one of the, um, models that's become very appealing is the Chinese model and the Bayesian consensus has become appealing as a system that's delivered stability and remarkable growth and um, the Western system especially if you look um, the reason I'm kind of doing the East and West thing is because um, I've recently been to Macedonia I've been to East Africa and the Middle East and it's almost a kind of it's really a battle of ideas, but a battle of, of trying to see which system um, is winning, if I can use that term, in terms of where countries um, along that kind of balkanized divide are saying, well, actually, um, the Western models um, haven't really worked for us, so maybe I should be looking at um, the Beijing model. And if I were to, um, they would actually give me more, some infrastructure funds as well. And so I think that to me is one of the reasons why I think this breakdown in consensus is really worth discussing. And I think on your question about why don't governments do something about it, I use a quote uh, from J.K. Galbraith in there, who, um, who, who was an advisor to numerous US presidents. He has a great quote where he says, I cannot think of a president who has been overburdened with a knowledge of economics. It's not, a, this is a historic quote. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, so the other, the other side of it is, I think there are certainly um, lots of ways in which, um, Paul's already described it, economics has become narrow and we're not touching on the big issues and yet economics is very influential. So it's almost a double-edged, um, uh, sword, if you want to put it that way. Um, but I also think that in terms of policymakers, I think there is um, the kind of long-term planning that you might need for some of these policies is sorely lacking. And this is why I kind of started this answer by referring to the Chinese model, which I think China has lots of challenges, it's done a great deal for its people, um, but its, its system, let's be very clear, is, is not democratic, it's unique to that country almost. And so I think the appeal of long-term planning is one of the elements that appeals to people because they see how electoral cycles work here. But to me, this um, balkanization in terms of dominant economic models is one that has to be, uh, we, have to, we have to start to really address. Um, and to, uh, you know, to come back to your original question, I think some of the new socialism in Scandinavia is appealing for a number of people because that seems to traverse a kind of middle path. I should say that Karl Marx, which I, who I write about, um, he doesn't believe in socialism because he says 
that's just tinkering around the edges. If you're going to go down this road, you have to go kind of full communism. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just tinkering. So it's about revolution, which, by the way, he never saw in his own lifetime. And he was often disappointed to never see revolution. So he, you know, he has that great phrase, history repeats itself. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. Um, so he never, so I'm not suggesting he saw all of this, but I'm just suggesting that um, we're almost repeating some of the debates from a century ago. That's great. Right, in the interest of repeating, let's get some questions. <laughs> the um, uh, gentleman at the front, why don't you both go? And then. Uh, could I ask Paul a question about the family, which uh, obviously I agree is a great thing to support. But the question I would like to ask is, does the state need to create an environment that supports the creation of the family when at the moment politicians, principally the left, but from other strands as well, seem to have questions as to whether the family is the best place to raise children. Yeah, I'd, I'd fully agree with the, the, the import of your question, that um, um, the, the idea that uh, families are somehow um, appropriate for the, for the right and not the left is, is, it, is, is socially suicidal. I think I mean it, 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 it's 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 a it's a it's a complete manifest delusion. Um, you just look at the evidence of how children are brought up, um, other than in families, and it's uniformly tragic. You know, so families got to work. Um, every I, here I rely a lot on uh, Alison Wolf, who's a great you know, analyst here, and as she says, every society on earth in, throughout history has had social pressures to try and get to, basically to insist that young, ma young men commit to the young women um, who, are, who are pregnant, you know. And, uh, and that's a, that's a, that's a time-honoured social process that's, that's been learned across societies. And, um, Although not in Keynes' inner circle. In terms of no, definitely not, um, uh, and um, and we need to we need to get back to that, but not through a system of you know sort of moral condemnation and that sort of the whole you know sanctimonious bullshit. Um, we need to help people, you know, and so um, uh, it's uh, it's not the the moralistic social pressure that does it; it's the practical. Thing of, of making it much, much easier. If you look at the survey evidence, um, something around 90% of young women, when they are pregnant, um, when the single young women, when they're pregnant, want to, to form a permanent commitment um, to, to the man, right? Um, and a majority of the men do. Um, but only a small minority are still together, you know, four or five years later. Uh, and that's because th 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 these situations are incredibly stressful. And, you know, many of you will have had a two-year-old. And my goodness. It should you know, be banned. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these pe people need a lot of support. Very predictable things. Let's Other get some societies more questions. do things. Yep. We, we brought our kid up, young kid up in, in France. We moved from America when he was two and a half. And France has got this wonderful system of free universal école maternelle, two and a half onwards. Everybody sends them because they're free, because everybody sends them, even the poorest families send them. Britain's had a system which is much more itsy bitsy, private this, private that, and it's gamed um, and it's not sufficiently inclusive. You know? So you need a social norm, everybody does it. Great, let's go here and then we'll take a few questions, otherwise we'll get through one go. Economics is more a contest over ideology than a social science, frankly. And uh, we see that very specifically with the concept of capitalism. There are as many definitions of capitalism as there are ideologues. Um, Professor Collier's book is about the future of capitalism, and I wonder, is there a definition of what capitalism is? And if so, would you mind telling us what it is, please? Okay. Let's get a few more questions. Yeah, by all means. I was wondering to what extent the crisis we have of economics at the moment is actually a crisis of values. 
Um, I ask because um, a lot of the instability I've seen, the questioning of norms, um, seems to be challenged not on a practical or an empirical basis, but on more of an ideological and even faith mm. basis. So people who espouse a particular view can be dismissive of others with opposing views, not on practical or theoretical mm. grounds, but on some kind of uh, belief basis. Mm. You don't mm. believe the right things. You are a traitor. Mm. You are um, bad. Mm. That we, It's almost like we're defining things in terms of... of something much more intrinsic mm. than just theory or even or, or okay. pragmatism. Yeah, mm. yeah, great. Paul definitely going to agree with that. Right, let's take two questions here, Laura, and then we'll back. Um, Charles Clark wrote an interesting book a couple of years ago called The Too Difficult Box. I don't know if either of you have read it. A very interesting read. Um, and I just wanted to ask, you know, we're obviously talking about quite big issues here with fixing capitalism. And I wanted to ask both panelists, please, if they could comment on perhaps what is a lack of political will to actually engage with those bigger issues. Um, you know, when you look at things like term limits, obviously people look to try to get reelected, so don't touch base with perhaps bigger issues which actually need addressing, like nuclear disarmament, you know, growing the welfare state and things like that. So I'd love to hear your comments. Great question. Well. I'd like to pick up on the narrowing horizons of economics, since this is about economic ideas. And probably, like yourself and many other people in this room, I'm a product of two supposedly really great universities for economics, one on each side of the Atlantic. And in both cases, in the era that I went, you know, postgraduate 80s, everything shrunk down. Not only were big ideas not encouraged, they were actively discouraged. Yeah, right. When I chose the doctoral topic I wanted to look at, I was told, that's too big. You've got to think small. You've got to think empirical or preferably theoretical. And so we have several generations of people who have actively been discouraged from thinking big. Mm -hmm. And the people in our government, many of them came from a program that was divided in the first year between politics, philosophy, and economics. And then they would get a slight idea of what economics is about, and that's where they stop. And so we've had generations of people talking about uh, macroeconomies as if they were households to be run to a budget. Now, why aren't we addressing these? You're talking big ideas, both of you. They require getting beyond what is coming from both, all sides of the political divide. And we economists are not putting our hands up and saying, actually, we can and we must think beyond this. This is not what economics is about. Okay, just want your reaction. It's that. a great question, but it's a bit socially awkward because Paul did PP. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's over there. There's a question right at the back. There's a question right at the back. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Dr. Collier um, how much he thought devolution is the solution to being shackled to the shark for the other regions of the UK. Great. Right, let's pick up some of those. So, the, um, do you want to offer a definition of capitalism to get started? Yeah, sure. I mean, so, so, let's not get fancy. It's, it, it doesn't mean who owns stuff. It means um, a decentralised decision system, really. So that's the, the essence. It's the opposite of central planning. Um, and, uh, and then within that decentralised decision system, you can do all sorts of variations um, as to you know, uh, who, who controls a company. It's a very, very important issue. Britain's got it disastrously wrong. Um, but it's very straightforward to fix it actually um do you want Great. to go we've right got on? we've got p lack of political will meaning everything is too difficult to do any of this big stuff which is a fair question and then what the narrowing horizons pp is a disaster <coughs> which you can take personally or not depending on your <laughs> mood um the um you know economists came th from about the 1970s onwards to um worship physics 
We all wanted to be physicists. But the sort of physics we, we wanted to be was actually um, Newtonian physics. It was very old-fashioned physics. Um, you know, it was the physics of billiard balls with atoms and, you know, and, and planets going round and that sort of, it was that sort of physics. Um, so individual actors with the billiard balls and you went ping, and, you know, and that whole thing. Um, actually, physicists, economists haven't noticed, but physicists gave all that stuff up over a century ago. Um, uh, it matters. Um, we, we just had a, um, a session at the Treasury last week, a conference trying to bring neuroscience and social psychology into economics. And we got a couple of physicists, very eminent physicists, to testify. And they just, they laughed themselves silly at economic models and their assumptions. I mean, this is quaint in their view, absolutely quaint. Um, for example, in all quantum physics, um, things only exist through interaction. And to my mind, the fundamentals in economics are not an individual maximizing. It's, it's social interaction. It's the, it's the social networks in which we live. They are the, the primary entity that we should be studying right. and the narratives that circulate in them and so forth. So there's a modern economics that's just being born, um, which is about groups uh, and, and identities formed in groups and beliefs in groups. Um, so we're moving on from all that crap, but, it, but it's a hard struggle, you know. Um, the, 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 the economists, in the, the, the mainstream economists in the audience were deeply hurt by their heroes, the physicists, saying what you're doing is silly. You know, it was painful. Um, well, none of us like to hear that. The, um, Linda, what about on this political will? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'm not, I, I think, I think in many ways because of the, um, the difficulty of, um, well, a number of things, right? So economists are very influential in policy making, but it's a very narrow type of um, economics. And so I think that, in a sense, um, has it doesn't help um, necessarily politicians shape big ideas. Um, so I think the, I think, you know, a lot of the things that, a lot of the policies which should be crafted should be much more longer term and should be evidence-based in terms of evaluation. So I mentioned before the kind of short-termism I think is part of it. But I think part of it is also um, the economic advice they're getting. Part of it is their own, um, I suppose, capacity to focus on, um, on uh, non-crisis type events. I think all of those play into it. Um, but I think you know, this issue about economists and values and being narrow and technical, I mean, in the, over uh, the 250 years of great economists that I write about, several of them were very ideological. And part of the um, evidence-based movement was in reaction to the Marx arguing against the Hayek's. So in other words, these very ideologically driven economists were sort of being, it was a rejection of using that and moving towards an evidence base that was in part um, how we, um, also part of the economic story. So I think we should, we should embrace economists taking on bigger ideas, trying to influence policy, um, using evidence as a base, but also recognizing the ideological lens of both the policymakers and the economists themselves. So what I struggled with in this book a bit is trying to tell the story of how these influential ideas um, one, the day at different times and the role of evidence behind that, but also the role of political influence. So for instance, um, Keynes was highly influential in the 1930s because he could explain unemployment. But by the 70s, he couldn't explain stagflation, which is high unemployment and high inflation. And that's when Milton Friedman and the monetarists came in. So it's not obvious to me um, how battles are won. And I would never want you to leave thinking the great economists somehow were not ideological or only evidence-based. It's a complicated mixture of things. Yeah. And the bit I always find depressing when I conclude this part is to say, the last time we had this consensus after the late, the long depression, the great depression in the 19th century, you know, when I describe the 1870s until 1940, 
the late 40s, that's about 70 years that it took to find a new consensus. And that consensus only lasted until really the 1990s, and it started to break down again. Um, I, was about, I was about yeah. to ask you to wrap up by giving us your view on optimism versus pessimism. Yeah, but I think I, just I think did you it. just answered yeah. that with like, the grimmest answer. <laughs> We're 10 years yeah. into 70 years. That's right, yes, that's uh, right, Charleston. Have you, got a, have you got a better answer to our chance? <laughs> please, please. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I wanted to just finish with ideology versus pragmatism because uh, I'm a pragmatist and the essence of pragmatism is to believe that all visions of utopia are false. There are no eternal truths, as it were. Um, where in a dynamic system where the, the problems keep evolving, and the solutions to those problems uh, are not looked up from some eternal book. They're worked out in the context of evidence and a practical problem. And we have to keep doing that. So the future of capitalism is an attempt to solve the practical problems here and now. It's not a blueprint forever. Right? Um, the ideological disputes are because we've got true believers in different utopias, and they're both or all dangerously wrong. The very proposition that there's a utopia there and here's the blueprint for it is, is just empirically ridiculous. And do you think the pragmatists are going to be able to overcome the mad utopians? Yes, I do. I think this is a winnable, it's a politically winnable fight because there's such disillusion. Um, both, both with the utter failures of the past and with the extremes, I think. Great. Look, can we um, thank our panel? And thank you all for coming. If you wish to buy the book on the way out, you can. They're both upstairs and they're so light you can bounce all the way home uh, with them, despite what I said at the beginning. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Have a good evening.